All right, thanks um, everybody for joining us. This is our last um, educational uh, talk of the afternoon. And um, we thank Dustin Boy for joining us. He's going to talk about managing the manure to really um, spread PEV and talk about an um, update on the current status of the PEV virus and um, basic biosecurity protocols to follow to avoid um, spreading um, PEV. So, Dustin doesn't have an extension appointment, so I'm really grateful that he was willing to come over and speak with us today. And, and um, I think uh, he'll give a really interesting talk. So, thank you very much, Dustin. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to be here. Um, my primary appointment's in the diagnostic lab and at, uh, um, in Lincoln, so we do a lot of work with uh, diagnosing and, and helping uh, sort of control these disease issues. I thought one of the main questions we might have is we're at a manure day, why are we talking about viruses? Um, well, PED is what we vets like to call a fecal oral virus, so the main route of transmission is uh, through feces and then uh, uh, re-exposure through the pigs. You know, that's why you're encouraged to wash your hands after you use the restroom, but it's hard to convince pigs to do that. So we gotta we gotta um, try to manage different ways that we can we can break that cycle, that fecal oral transmission. And, and one way that that, uh, that can be done is through manure management. So I'll talk a little bit about what we know and uh, maybe what what we, what we don't know about PED and how that can uh, be addressed through some different basic biosecurity uh, protocols. Uh, well, first uh, I'm sure you saw seen the headlines. You know. Big virus precaution cuts and the hog numbers at the fair. A lot of people worried as we, we go into fair season about PEDV. Uh, people worried about bacon prices. The media likes to talk about bacon. If they can put that in a headline, it seems to draw that in. Um, so you see a lot of this. Um, I'll talk about what we know about the disease so far, where it's at in the U.S., some of the history about it, um, the type of virus it is. It's called a coronavirus. Um, so some of the coronaviruses that we see in pigs. Uh, what clinically it might look like if there's an outbreak, um, biosecurity, and then, then uh, diagnosis, and, and uh, how we can help sort of break these disease cycles. Uh, so PED in the U.S., uh, so far there's been uh, what um, the reporting likes to call uh, 7,719 cases. Uh, this word cases can be a bit confusing because it might not be an individual pig. That might be a, a barn, it might be a farm, it might be a whole flow. So it might be a, a big sow operation and all the finishers that are underneath it. That might only count as a single case. So it can be a bit tricky in trying to figure out what, what that total number can mean. Um, Iowa's been the, one of the leaders in PED, so that's where some of the first cases were from. There's been 2,165 cases. Minnesota and North Carolina, the, the biggest swine states following that. In Nebraska, we started to see cases in about December this year. Um, and through the spring, those continue to increase, so we're at about 175 uh, at the end of June. Uh, it's widespread in Mexico, and then some of the provinces in Canada, uh, they have had cases. Here's what the distribution looks like on the map. Uh, the National Animal Health Laboratory Network tracks these. Uh, and so for each case that we diagnose, they, they put in their system, and then we can sort of try to follow these uh, cases in real time. You can see that uh, it's sort of concentrated in the, the upper Midwest um, within uh, a lot of cases in North Carolina. So it sort of follows the pig numbers in the cases as you would expect. Um, one thing which we thought we might see, but we weren't sure until it happened this spring, was that we'd see a decline in, in cases of PED as we got into the summer. Um, I'll show you some data of stability of coronaviruses that uh, shows that they're really dependent on the temperature. So as we would expect, as the temperatures got colder in the winter, um, the amount of virus that could stay in the environment was increased. And so we saw higher cases over the winter months, and those start to decline as we get into the summer. Uh, as that heat uh, kills the virus that's in the environment or in the manure, uh, they were less likely to affect pigs. So you can see that those are decreasing as we get into June and July. I would expect those come back up as it starts to cool off in October. So here's the effects it's had on the, on the markets. Uh, hog prices, this is data, this is from the spring. You can see that it really had a big increase in the markets as we saw expansion of the virus. Uh, pig numbers went down and then the litter rates went way down because this mainly affects young pigs. Okay, so um, what we really don't know about PED is where we got it from in the U.S. Um, it's been around in other countries for a long, long time. So it was first diagnosed in the U.K. in 1971. It then spread throughout Europe and Asia, uh, and it was endemic in most, throughout most of the continent in 1982. 
to um, how we got it in the U.S. is still unknown. So there's a lot of speculation on where and how that might have came from, but we, we did get it. Uh, when we look at the sequence of the virus that came from China, but we don't know how or, or how it actually got into the, the U.S. pig population. Uh, and it's similar to another virus you might have heard of, TGE, which was a big problem maybe 20 years ago. Uh, they're really uh, close cousins in that they cause a similar disease. They're spread in similar manners, and, and TGE's been in the U.S. for a long time. Um, but all, all our pigs are completely naive to PED, uh, so it caused a real severe outbreak. They don't have any immune, immunity to the disease, um, so it was really severe. Uh, one thing that you know, it doesn't affect humans or other animals. It's really a pig exclusive uh, problem, so that the risk to other animals or people is, is so uh, I want to emphasize that PED, that it's all pigs in all ages, are, can be susceptible to the, the disease. So a sow that is, has not been exposed to the virus is just as susceptible to a newborn pig. The only difference is the mortality rates can be much, much different. Um, so those young pigs, uh, since this causes a diarrhea, they're really susceptible to that dehydration that comes with it. They don't have very much body mass. They don't have a lot of fluid. So we can see really tremendous amounts of mortality um, in uh, nursery and uh, pigs in those farrowing barns. Um, so you get almost 100% mortality in those pigs that are three to four weeks old. As the pigs get uh, up to, towards weaning age, it really drops off to 20 to less than 5%. So uh, our, our biggest risk is in those uh, farrowing and nursery barns. We want to keep those, keep the virus out of those uh, sites and those facilities because they can have a tremendous impact on the, on the breeding herd and the number of pigs that are weaned. So um, unfortunately, when PED came, it wasn't the only virus uh, that's come along. Now we have new new viruses. One of these is called Delta coronavirus. Um, so they seem that this thing came along at the same time. So they think there may be um, some shared root that they came into the U.S. These really cause a similar disease, and it's sort of an academic problem on the differences in them because they do cause pretty similar uh, type diseases and are spread in similar ways. However, the USDA groups these now as a cluster called swine enteric corona diseases. So if you see that acronym, that's referring to PED and, and the related viruses um, by, by the USDA. Uh, so for um, PED, it's diagnosed by what's called a PCR test. So this is like what they use in CSI to, to look at uh, somebody that caused the crime. We look for the nucleic acid or the, the DNA of the virus, the RNA in this case. We look for that fingerprint in fecal samples, uh, and then we can detect that and be able to tell if there's PED on the farm. Um, there's also blood tests to detect the antibodies to PED, so if those pigs have been sick and now they're, they're healthy, we can test to see if they've had an immune response to those. Uh, and that's a serological test or a blood test. Um, so there's two different tests that are available. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the USDA's um, new regulation on PED. And part of that new regulation is they do support some of the diagnostic testing uh, for PCR from approved samples in some herds. So that may be an option for producers if, if they have a PED problem or suspect it, there may be some help in, uh, in diagnostic testing. I wanted to mention this, that there was a federal order. Uh, Governor or, um, uh, Vilsack came out and said that uh, in the USDA there's a, a new federal order that's going to regulate the PED and uh, swine enteric corona disease viruses. Uh, and part of this is that each herd that is diagnosed needs to have a biosecurity plan uh, for the herd. Um, if they you do do a biosecurity plan and you enroll and implement it in consultation with your veterinarian, um, then they won't impose any, any quarantines or herd restrictions on, on uh, infected animals. Uh, and then part of this is they may offer some reimbursement for vehicle cleaning. Uh, disinfectants, different things that may be helpful in, in, uh, in implementing that biosecurity plan. Uh, and part of that is you need a premise ID number. So uh, work with your veterinarian. If, if you do are dealing with some of these issues, it can help you put together one of these plans and there may be some compensation for uh, bad biosecurity and disinfectants. Okay, so in, in uh, biosecurity basics, not only in herds that may have PED, but these are important to, um, to keep in mind because as we notice, you can never predict what agents may come into the U.S. Um, and, uh, and, and put in there. Uh, so one of the most basics is you want to limit the traffic. So people and equipment that may come onto the farm, uh, you want to try and limit that, whether it's feed trucks, whether it's manure trucks. 
Um, it needs to be the ones that only need to be there from the, the time they need to be. Um, really, we need to thoroughly disinfect anything coming onto the farm, uh, especially things that may carry animals, such as trailers and trucks that can handle live animals uh, that are going to be transporting them. Those are highest risk. Uh, in addition to uh, manure hauling equipment, um, we need to enforce the downtime requirements. So, uh, people that may visit the farm or have to be there for a certain time, we need to make sure that they they have not been on another farm for uh, 24 to 48 hours, and then keep track of who's been on the farm so you can uh, figure out who's been there, uh, where where might the risk be in our, our biosecurity. One important concept is a line of separation. So do we have line of separation on our farm? Is there a line either hypothetical or that's actually drawn on the premises that can show um, where people that are going to interact with the pigs or be um, working with pigs, uh, where's that line of separation between those and those that may be on the farm to uh, deliver feed or handle manure? Do we have those boundaries well well um, demarcated? And do the people that are on the farm know of them? And how can we uh, get, get those lines separated and established? Um, uh, precautions when uh, the disposing of dead stock. With PED in particular, we're getting tremendous amounts of uh, of uh, animals that, that may have uh, died from the virus, and they're going to be a big source of uh, continued uh, infection on the herd. So uh, one one uh, concept is to uh, isolate the animals and compost them in a, in a secure area where they won't be exposed to other pigs. Um, so we want to reduce the amount of, uh, of handling and uh, exposure those infected carcasses may, may have to the pigs uh, on the farm. And then shower in more practical. And make sure that you're changing into clean boots and coveralls whenever you go into those, uh, when you cross those lines of separation in the areas that may uh, have pig activity. Um, so manure handling in, in particular, like I said, these are fecal oral viruses. So PED and all the swine coronaviruses are spread by manure. So um, I think uh, uh, Dr. Baker had said that one, one spoonful of uh, manure has enough virus to infect all the pigs in Nebraska probably the U.S. There's hundreds of billions of virus particles uh, in a manure sample from uh, a few grams of manure from an infected pig. So uh, these billions of virus particles are, are going to be in that manure. They're going to stay there for an amount of time. And that's going to be a, a big source of how these are transmitted from farm to farm. So anything that can, can transport manure uh, can transport the virus from, from pig to pig. Uh, these viruses are stable for several weeks. I showed you before as we got into the hot weather, the, the stability of the virus declined, so there's less risk in hot weather, um, and then less if there's sun. So if there's UV light, that inactivates virus and can help reduce the amount of virus in the manure sample. Um, so here's that, that survival. These are going to be stable for at least a month at low temperature. You can see that uh, uh, at four degrees up here in the corner, there's really no change in virus, uh, the amount of virus in a sample. Um, over a month's period of time at, at four degrees and at low humidity. So these can be really persistent in the environment, especially in the winter months. Um, for, for manure haulers, we want to communicate well. We want to establish that line of separation. So if you have a manure hauler or you are a manure hauler going on your farm, you want to talk to the, um, the manager or the owner, figure out where that line of separation is, and really communicate between uh, the, the manager and the, the farm workers and the manure hauler on where the, where you want them to be on the site, what biosecurity protocols they need to take. You want to wear clean coveralls and boots on each farm and make sure that vehicle is disinfected. You want to completely disinfect and make sure the equipment can dry. Really drying is the important thing. Uh, organic debris um, inactivates disinfectants, so we want to remove all that organic debris. That's going to be what's going to allow that virus to persist. So any, any sort of manure that's left on any of the surfaces can and inactivate the disinfectant. Uh, heat is really helpful. So things like trailer bakers or room bakers that elevate the, the temperature will help dry out that virus and really inactivate it. So there are four things to remember in disinfection are going to be heat, uh, dry, the disinfectant, and time, letting the disinfectant sit in those um, surfaces. And then, like I said, this is a big challenge in winter, not only because the virus is persistent, but those disinfectants are uh, often water-based, and so they freeze. They can freeze before they have adequate time to uh, be active. Here's a list of uh, effective disinfectants against PED. Uh, so there's phenols, peroxides, anything from Tektrol to Clorox. Bleach at the right concentration is effective at, at, uh, at killing PED. 
So again, you really want to pre try to prevent this disease and instead of getting it. You want to manage the risk. So anything that's going to be moving in and off the farm is a risk. You want to manage those, try to keep them to a minimum. Um, you want to make biosecurity a priority. I know that oftentimes you're in a hurry, but really you know, a, a little bit of time and effort put into biosecurity can really go a long way. These vehicles are going to be the critical control point. So anything that's left the farm and come back uh, is going to be a big risk, and so those need to be assessed. Well, and then environmental elimination from exposure. Um, this has been a problem in those herds that have had an outbreak. Now they're trying to get rid of it. Uh, what do we do to, to try and eliminate the amount of virus that's in the environment? And this is an, an active area of, of research and trying to figure out how we can reduce um, exposure in the environment. Um, so there's some really good resources. Uh, if you have questions about PED, uh, the PERC.org, they have a place on the website called um, PED Resources. They have handouts on everything from the newer hauler guidelines to, uh, to the basics of the, the virology of PED. Um, they have these in, in both English and Spanish. So there's some really good uh, uh, resources there. And then AASV.org, that's uh, American Association of Swine Veterinarians, it has another great uh, PED resource. Um, and then if, uh, if, if I can do anything, if you have any questions for me, my, my contact information is here. I'd be uh, happy to, to help out. So if anybody has any questions, be happy to take a look. Let's give a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> we, um, in fact, um, Lester and I and a couple other folks just um, got funded to do a research project where we're going to look at just that question. Um, we're going to do some lab scale studies looking at um, material that's inoculated with positive virus and do some time temperature combinations in the lab to see what sort of um, reductions we can get in the virus. And then we're going to do um, larger scale composting of of piglets that are PED positive in biosecure rooms on campus so we can, um, we can monitor the temperature throughout the file and look at over time um, whether or not that virus is eliminated or not. So we think we're going to hit temperatures. Um, you know, we can, if you were listening to the mortality complex we talked this morning, um, you know that those temperatures were up around 140, 150 degrees and they were holding it there for several hours to several days. Um, so we think that it's logical that compost you would destroy the virus, but nobody really looked at that yet, so that's what we're trying to figure out. Uh, how will you tell if you have a viable virus or not? Yeah, is, is there a test to determine it? Yeah, so test is. Yeah, so um, we're, we're looking at combinations of different ways to do that. Some ways are, like I said, sort of PCR based tests where you look for the virus and the acid. That might not mean that it's viable. So you can use assays on that and see if it's in the same as in the cell cultures and the computers. Some other groups are looking at things like bioassays, especially things like food. They want to see if the food has virus and they feed it with pigs and see if they can affect it. So there's several ways you can do that. Unfortunately, doing things like bioassays and affecting pigs is not as easy as that. We're looking at a combination. Yeah, there's a there's ongoing research looking at the duration of that. But at least in the short term, uh, in the cells get infected, they're able to pass um, immunity onto their tubules through the tumor. Um, and stuff like that can, continues on for uh, you know, at least one cycle. It's not an entirely persist. The idea is that you can get infected and you can still get moved at the same time when the virus goes away. So that's the idea. It's not really known how long that you need to pass. Several years after that. I think there's also some work that's um, being done to look at how long that virus survives in stored manure under building in lagoons. Um, and we also, we've been talking to some folks at Fort Ford about 
looking at how long um, it survives on the soil surface or, or, or being injected, you know, when the is injected in the soil. Is it going to survive over the winter and be there still in the spring, those sorts of things. So there's probably more questions than answers right now, but um, Perkord has dedicated a lot of funding to this already and they still, um, they still have more projects they want to fund. So hopefully in the next several months we'll be able to answer more questions. Yeah. Yeah, I mean there was a lot of lab studies that look at you know, put on surface and you know, uh, it's a real question if you can get in there to the penetrate. So a lot of that depends on how much you do. Yeah, I think it's just like in the trailers, you know, you can you can power wash a trailer and just one little bit of it that gets stuck behind something or in a crevice that you don't get it can still have the five five percent or so you know with uh, land application same thing it's is there a specific system that that's working in the water I cannot to know of even some standard ones like there that even you mentioned getting it clean before you disinfect uh in the field and that organic material starts to They all have the same issues that they're looking at and that it's not a good system. So it's just a matter of getting it clean and getting it disinfected and getting it to the top. So you can have a lot of waste in that. And the question is, can you magically do it with some kind of basis? Yeah, you can have an evaluation source if you have the <laughs> oh yeah, so um, for those of you who are very diagnostic, we're in the final phases of design. So, uh, our metals are the board of agents, they achieved it. Uh, we should be uh, on the way to start discussion here in the next couple of weeks.